Jesus came and lived as one of us, loving and teaching those around him. And he laid down his life on the cross and was buried. And of course, we know scripture records his resurrection and eventual ascension into heaven. But what was this all about? Why did God become a man? Why did the word take up our flesh, our nature? Why did Jesus come to die? In this seven-part series, we review the 17 unique claims comprising penal substitutionary atonement, and we consider each claim in light of Scripture and the historic church's teachings. Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows for the cause of Christ. I am your host, Warren McGrew. Now, this is uh, going to be part one of, I believe, seven episodes in a, a series of somewhat short format uh, episodes exploring the doctrine of the atonement. And, and joining me in this, uh, for this endeavor is, is Paul Vondrady. He is a former podcaster and, and radio producer from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, his podcast series, Critiquing Penal Substitutionary Atonement, ran from about 2011 to 2016. And uh, and Paul, thank you so much for joining me here, sir. Um, welcome to the show. Welcome to Idol Killer. Thanks, Warren. Love your work. <laughs> thank you. I, lo- I appreciate yours. I love yours as well. Um, I found your, your, uh, your research and your presentation on this to be fascinating. I think, I think it was, was it 72, 77, somewhere in there episodes uh, in your your series critiquing PSA, and that was um, very eye opening to say the least. Well, Warren, thanks for the kind words. It took a lot of effort to put that series together, and I'm glad it was helpful. It was it was extremely so, and I'm not the only one that that uh, has noted that. I have a lot of friends that have uh, uh, commented on on it as well. Now, uh, with, with with all of that said. Uh, we want to keep this as, as short format as we can. Uh, I'm somewhat long-winded and known for two and three hour Q&A uh, live stream sessions. And every time I tell them that it's going to be short format, it ends up being a two and a half hour episode. But this one, I really want to do my best to to keep us on task. And But at, at any point, just feel free to elaborate. Um, but uh, as this is part one of seven, uh, I believe in this in this episode particularly, we're going to be exploring the the terms and various definitions that people will need to to know the the restored icon model as well. We'll be touching on that, looking at the various things comprising uh, PSA, the history of the Atonement School. Um, but with that said, Paul, would you get us started on today's episode? Sure. Warren, I'm glad we're starting with definitions. The two terms we're going to be dealing with right at the outset are atonement and propitiation. Warren, what we mean by atonement is reparation for a wrong or an injury. And by propitiation, what we mean is to take somebody who is not well disposed toward you and make him well disposed to you by means of atonement. So again, the big word we got is atonement. That means reparation for a wrong or an injury. But Warren, as we've discussed in private conversations, we run into trouble right off the bat because in the theological arena, the word atonement has a much broader definition. In the theological arena, all Christians, whether we're talking about Western Christians or Eastern Christians, and let me define those terms, Western would be Catholic and Protestant, Eastern would be Eastern Orthodoxy. It would be Monophysite churches like the Coptic Church of Egypt. It would be the dwindling Nestorian churches. So that's what I'm talking about. When Eastern and Western Christians approach the question of atonement, they're all looking at the same data set. The data set comprises the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And Warren, when we look at that data, the question that immediately poses itself is why did Christ have to die in order for our sins to be forgiven? And this is where it gets really confusing because in systematic theology, any answer that you give to that question 
is called a theory of atonement. The reason it's called that is because the prevailing view among Catholics and Protestants is that the death of Christ is reparation for a wrong or an injury. That's what we said atonement means. So they say the death of Christ is atonement. The obvious problem though, is that when you ask somebody, why did Christ have to die in order for our sins to be forgiven? Not everybody says it's atonement. For example, the Pelagian school of thought looks at the data set and they infer not atonement, but rather they infer a moral exemplar model. And by the way, there's quite a bit of data in First Peter that would seem to support that model. When an Eastern Orthodox mystic is confronted with the data set, he might infer something like a mousetrap model or a bait and switch model. When church fathers like Gregory of Nazianzus look at that data set, they infer what I call a restored icon model. And that's what I advocated for in my old podcast series. Now, the bottom line on that, Warren, is not one of those schools of thought understands the death of Christ to be atonement. Yet, every one of them is called a theory of atonement. That means that people like you and I, Warren, are in the bizarre situation where we have a doctrine of the atonement that has nothing to do with atonement. So when I was doing my podcast series, I had to refer to Gregory of Nazianzus's restored icon model as a theory of atonement, even though it's not atonement, it's about healing. And you, Warren, got backed into the same expedient on the idol killer statement of beliefs, because you said in one sentence, we affirm the atonement of Christ. Then in the next sentence, you had to clarify that you reject penal substitutionary atonement. And that, Warren, is the incredibly confusing, chaotic situation we're in at the moment. Yeah, it, it's language and, and uh, how we understand those terms are just, uh, it's so critical to being able to communicate effectively, but we're approaching this with a completely uh, different definition using the same vocabulary. And like you said, using the same data set. So every Christian has some understanding as to why Christ came. And we generally will call it an atonement theory. Right. But what exactly does atonement mean? And as you said, uh, that has a very specific definition that not every atonement theory actually uh, would necessarily meet. So it's fascinating to see just the nuance that, that has uh, evolved or developed over the years and how, how it causes uh, uh, confusion and, and miscommunication and and even even um, sometimes resentment and animosity towards a brother right. says, well, why did Jesus come? Don't don't you affirm the atonement? But but they're using different understandings. And so uh, it can it can cause a, a lot of problems. Yeah, Warren, it is chaos. And as you well know, my hero for more than half my life has been the great Walter Martin the guy who wrote The Kingdom of the Cults. Walter Martin was absolutely adamant that when you deal with the groups that he considers aberrant, you have to scale the language barrier. You have to make sure that you and your interlocutor are not using the same term with two different meanings. So what happens, I was having a conversation on the phone the other night, and the person I was speaking with says, well, don't you believe you know Christ had to die? And I said, sure. But when I use that phrase, I have a different understanding of it than you do. The resonances are completely different. And to tell you the truth, Warren, I still don't have good terminology to use. I mean, what do we say? Do we say the work of Christ? Do we say the redemption? Any kind of term we use is theory laden already. So we're, we're really in a tough spot. As you remember from the podcast series, the the theory of atonement, and again, we have to use that understanding, the under, answering the question, why did Christ have to die? The theory that I advocate for comes from Gregory of Nazianzus, and I decided to call it the restored icon model. So to back up just a little bit and repeat what we were talking about earlier, we're all looking at that same data set. 
The data set is the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. The question we have to answer is why are all the components in this data set critical to our salvation? Now, in my opinion, the guy who gave the best answer to that is Gregory of Nazianzus. He was a church father from the fourth century. His famous statement about Christ is that which he hath not assumed, he hath not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. So Gregory of Nazianzus basically is saying, God became man, he became incarnate, then he died and rose again in order to heal the human condition. All right, to understand what I mean by heal, we have to take a brief moment to look into the anthropology that the church fathers were working with. In the anthropology of the church fathers, human beings are an icon of God. That goes all the way back to Genesis 126. Let us create man in our image after our likeness. That's Genesis 126. The version of the Old Testament that Christ, his apostles, and all of the early Eastern church fathers were using was a Greek language translation called the Septuagint. Now in the Septuagint, in Genesis 126, the word there for image, let us create man in our image, is the Greek word ikona. That gets transliterated into English as E-I-K-O-N-A. Looks like icona. So Warren, if you see the word icona, what word do you assume that we get from that in English? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's icon. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So yeah. in the Septuagint, Genesis 126, which is the version that Christ himself would have been using, it says man is God's icon. Now, Warren, another interesting datum about the Septuagint is that it contained a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. I'm going to take a moment to read from Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image, again, in the Septuagint, that's ikona, of his own eternity. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world, and they that do hold of his side do find it. So, Warren, here's what we got. Genesis, in the Septuagint, says that mankind is an icon of God. The Wisdom of Solomon, which is also from the Septuagint, elaborates. It says that mankind is created as an icon or a mosaic of the immortal God. But Satan has come along with a brick and smashed the mosaic. And all the pieces of the mosaic have fallen to the ground. And here's where Gregory of Nazianzus steps in with his theory. Gregory of Nazianzus says that the third, the second, excuse me, the second person of the Trinity, the word of God, becomes incarnate. And in becoming incarnate, he picks up all of those pieces of the shattered icon, attaches them to his divinity, and thereby restores the icon. And that's where we get the term restored icon model. Mm. Right. And, 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 and this, this, one of the things that this touches on is it's not just the crucifixion, which I don't want to diminish. And it's not the suffering. It's not the resurrection. It's not, but it, it's, it's the incarnation. It's the life. It's the death, the resurrection. It's the entirety of Christ's ministry here on earth. It's not focusing yeah. on one particular aspect, but it's on the entire life and mission of Christ for those approximate 33 years. It's the whole data set. Yeah. Yeah, so on the podcast series, I played some audio clips from a man named W.O. Vought, who was definitely of the atonement school of thought. And he says explicitly, it is only the death of Christ that matters. Now, of course, that completely would go against the restored icon model, because in order to heal every aspect of humanity, Christ has to attach every aspect of humanity to himself. And humanity is not simply mortal. I mean, death is only one part of the human condition. Obviously, life is part of the human condition. So the entirety 
of the human condition has to be attached to the word of God, the second person of the Trinity. And this, in my opinion, is why the seven ecumen ecumenical councils made so much hay of all that seeming minutia. In other words, Christ has to have a human soul, contra Apollinarius. Christ has to have a human mind. He has to have a human nature, contra the Monophysites. Christ has to have all of the aspects of humanity, because if any one of those aspects is not attached to the word of God, then those aspects are not healed. Yeah, and we, we see that in Hebrews. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite passages when, when really focusing on the incarnation is, is uh, Hebrews uh, 12, 14 through 18, where it talks about how he had to be, uh, he, he came in our flesh, our likeness, but he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. And if you understand that the reason he was like his brothers in every respect was to assume that so that he could heal it, all of a sudden it starts to make more sense. And you go, oh, now I, I see the, the intent and the purpose behind this language. Right. And think about how Hebrews begins. If you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. That's the restored icon model right there. It tells you that Christ comes to destroy the work of the devil, which according to the Septuagint is making man mortal by damaging the icon, and Christ defeats the devil by taking mortality to himself, dying, and then rising from the dead. Thereby, Christ defeats the devil. That's the whole purpose of the work of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And that was the same passage I was, I was citing. I said 12. I meant Hebrews 2. I appreciate yeah. you correcting me on that because um, it, it is. It, it, we're, we see the mission of Christ being laid out very clearly there in, in Scripture. Well, Warren, I think it might be time for us to describe a little bit what the antithesis of the restored icon model is. The model of atonement that everyone is familiar with in Western Christianity, and in fact, it has also seeped into Eastern Christianity, and many people in Eastern Orthodoxy are now professing penal substitutionary atonement. The model of penal substitutionary atonement actually begins with a man named Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. His dates are roughly, I think, 354 to 430. Absolutely, colossally influential figure from the late antique era. And Augustine came up with the ideas of original sin, total depravity, and infant depravity. Those form the matrix on which the medieval model of the atonement would be, would be established. So many centuries after Augustine came a cleric named Anselm. His dates are 1033 to 1109. Anselm took those three claims of Augustine and he posited atop those three claims an additional nine claims. And that became the classic Catholic model of atonement. Now, many centuries after that came another group of thinkers. I call them the Atonement School. These thinkers are virtually all modern Protestants, and they've contributed an additional five claims to the nine of Anselm and the three of Augustine. So when one looks at the model of atonement that's bandied about now on Christian radio, in Christian books, in the blogosphere, basically in Western Christianity as a whole, we're dealing with something that's known as the substitutionary theory of atonement, the satisfaction theory of atonement, vicarious atonement, penal substitutionary atonement, I abbreviate that PSA, and it's a model that comprises 17 claims. And Warren, I was actually very impressed with the work you did in your own video on the atonement because you uncovered when the atonement school actually originated. Well, it, it was it was... The, the penal substitutionary atonement was first formally articulated in the writings of, from what I can find, right? Uh, in the writings of Charles Hodge, he, he released uh, Systematic Theology roughly 1871. 
some papers that I found said 1873, but I think it was released originally in 1871. And that's where he, he finally formally uh, articulated the, the penal substitutionary view. It, it had been in work, really kind of evolving since Elmsholm, but that's when it came to a culmination. Dad, it's important for us to note that neither of us is questioning the brilliance of any of the men we've named. Uh, Augustine and Anselm are considered doctors of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is an institution that's renowned for its intellectual tradition. And of course, these men in the Atonement School, they all have major ministries, they've written Bible commentaries, they're incredibly pro prolific writers and, and speakers. What we're, I think what the two of us are saying is that the model, the composite model of atonement that we're gonna be looking at simply does not account for all of the data. It is not inference to the best explanation. In my opinion, the restored icon model is the inference to the best explanation when it comes to accounting for all of the data in our data set. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's arguably, uh, penal substitutionary atonement or, or PSA arguably is the most well-known, most widely accepted, at least, you know, uh, to these American eyes, it's the most widely accepted view presently. Uh, when I was, when I was coming out of uh, my background as a Calvinist, one of the first things I had to confront was my understanding of, of the atonement or the work of Christ. And I had to stop and say, well, wait a minute. If some of these things I'm seeing aren't, um, in keeping with what I had thought they were, well, then what does that do for why I understand Christ came? And I had to stop and, and really spend almost a year studying uh, the various evolution of, of, of Christian thought on why Christ even came and, and lived and died and suffered. Um, but it is, it is arguably the most predominant view right now. And I don't think too many Christians are even aware that there are other views that that are historic and grounded in the history of the church and grounded in scripture. And so I think that productions like this are going to be very beneficial because now all of a sudden, maybe there's some viewers out there that said, you know, that I've been feeling and studying and thinking that maybe this didn't take advantage of the data set. Maybe there's some conflict here. I thought that was what I had to accept as a Christian, but now I'm seeing that there's actually other views that make more sense and are perhaps, you know, better in line with scripture. And all of a sudden it's a breath of fresh air and things click. And so that's, that's why I think this program especially is going to be very helpful for, for those Christians that have been struggling with it. And Warren, the language barrier is a massive problem. If we can return to that, you and I were talking on the phone and we, I talked about the classic case where you have a disgruntled Protestant, he wants to leave Protestantism because he now rejects sola fide and he rejects penal substitutionary atonement. He shows up at the office of an Orthodox priest and says, hey, what, what's your doctrine of the atonement? So the Orthodox priest thinks for a minute. In his head, he opens up his English to Romanian dictionary. He says, what, atonement? Reparation for a wrong or an injury? We don't have any such concept in orthodoxy. Then he looks at the Protestant and says, we don't have a doctrine of the atonement. And the Protestant leaves there thinking the guy is a moron. Well, in fact, it was just a miscommunication because the priest was taking the lexical definition of atonement, reparation for a wrong or an injury, whereas the Protestant meant atonement as, what is your answer to the question, why did Christ have to die? So the terminology causes a massive divide between Eastern and Western Christians, because the ones who are the keepers of this restored icon model are the Eastern Orthodox. But you'll be hard pressed to find any Eastern Orthodox authority who can explain it. Yeah, no, we, we, we tend to speak past one another because of these, these language issues. Yeah, we're doing what Walter Martin and JP Moreland, all the big counter cult figures on on the Protestant side have told us not to do, you know, use terminology without defining it first. Yeah, no, exactly. And, 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 and it, 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 it's, it's eye opening really when you realize I may be using a, com 
a, a completely different dictionary for the same terms and not know that there are other uh, understandings, def definitions. Mm -hmm. And then once you're able to expand the way that these terms are de defined, all of a sudden now you're going, well, wait a minute. Oh, this, I understand this differently now. Now I'm not seeing the same sort of tension that I once did, or maybe I'm not having to appeal to mystery on this particular topic because now that <clears throat> definition now that definition is is fitting better with you know with what I'm seeing in scripture. So I think that's very important. It's a yeah, yeah. absolutely. And Warren, we talked about the 17 claims of PSA and the three sources from which they came. Maybe now would be a good time for me to outline what those 17 claims are. Yeah, please, please. And we started out with Augustine 354 to 430 again probably the most influential person in the entire history of Christianity, just massively influential. You cannot understate how influential he is. And the three things he came up with form the three basis, the, the, the foundation and the first three claims of PSA. Claim number one is the idea that because Adam is mankind's federal head, all mankind is guilty of his sin in the Garden of Eden. The shorthand for that is original sin. The second claim says that as a result of original sin, all mankind is now totally depraved. Shorthand for that is total depravity. The third claim is very close to the second one. It's the idea that infants, even though they are innocent of actual sin, are guilty of original sin and are therefore totally depraved, just like adults. So Anselm took those three claims and he built atop it the claims that he came up with, which are nine in number. The fourth claim in this composite model says that uh, the gravity of a sin is dependent on the status of the one sinned against. I'm going to show in a later lecture that that's simply an artifact of the medieval period. It is not biblical. Yeah. The fifth claim also comes from Anselm, and Anselm says that all sin is to be thought of as a debt that we owe God for the crime of having robbed him of honor through our sin. That's a horrible anthropomorphism, but we'll give it, get to that in more detail later on. Okay, the next claim, claim number six in PSA, is that even infants owe God this debt because infants have sinned and therefore owe him. The seventh claim in our composite model actually is the first one that comes from the atonement school. So this is a modern claim. And it may surprise you that this is a modern claim, but the claim goes that God instituted the Old Testament sacrificial system because the debt mentioned in claims five and six has to be paid with blood. Claim number eight and nine go together. Claim number eight says that God could have canceled this debt simply by willing it. Claim number nine, but God cannot forgive a sin without first punishing the sinner and cannot forgive a debt unless he first collects the debt from an alternate source. I'm, I know you've heard that claim before. Absolutely. Yep. So eight. So claims eight, nine, and ten come from Anselm. Okay. Claim number 11 is the claim about propitiation, which is one of the terms that we define at the top. And this is the idea that only the blood of a God-man is, is the, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that, the only commodity valuable enough to recompense God for his offended honor is the shed blood of a God-man. That's claim number 11, which leads into claim 12, so the son of God becomes incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth so that his human nature can suffer and die as our substitute. When we go to claim number 13, we have another claim from the modern atonement school. This is the idea that God pours out his wrath on Christ, pretending that Christ is we, the ones who actually deserve to be punished. In the process, God takes Christ's righteousness imputes it unto the wicked and takes the wickedness of the wicked and imputes it unto Christ. That's known as double imputation. Okay. The idea of double, double predestination, double imputation has 
uh, has predecessors in the thinking of, of Augustine, but it's very heavily developed in the modern atonement school. Claim number 14 is the idea that Christ becomes a literal curse and the embodiment of sin when he's on the cross. R.C. Sproul was very famous for this claim. Yeah. Claim number 15, also from the atonement school, is the idea that God turns his back on the crucified Christ. Claim 16 is the final claim from the atonement school. It says that Christ fulfills all the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament, which I am going to argue against later on. And then finally, the last claim is the claim that the death of Christ ransoms us from the wrath of God. And that Warren, those Warren are the 17 claims that compose PSA. Yeah, and, and I, I really appreciate you breaking these out as well, because when we're talking about, well, why, why are there two guys on Idol Killer right now discussing penal substitution? That just means that Jesus had to die so he could save us. Well, no, there are many redemptive models, many rescue models, many, many understandings of why Christ came, but each one of them is making a unique claim or set of claims. And so if we're going to consider the merits of these uh, models or theories, we need to make sure we're, we're actually understanding the unique claims of each one of these so we can weigh them against scripture. So knowing the 17 unique claims of, of PSA is critical because one of the things that I've noticed is many well-intended, I, I believe very well-intended Christian um, apologists and, and YouTubers and, and theologians, lay level all the way to scholarly, often will ignore the unique claims of PSA and will instead talk about the broader things that every model uh, generally will accept, which is Jesus saves us. Well, what is he saving us from? How is he doing that? These are where we get into the nuance. So by breaking out these 17 points, that's really going to help people see exactly what these claims are and then consider them on their own merits. And Warren, I really hate to pull a Matt Slick here. This is heresy. But I'm going to use the word heresy. The word heresy basically is an innovation in religion, something that's new. And think about the dates of the three sources for the model of penal substitutionary atonement. Augustine is born in 354. Anselm was born in 1033. And then I think you said the date on uh, the modern atonement school was 1871. That's just a little too late to be an actual biblical apostolic teaching. Well, what's, what's interesting is um, we'll consider, depending on, depending on where you are, um, you know, what your tradition is and who, where, what your perspective is. Many people will call Augustine an early church father. But again, if we look at the dates when Augustine comes on the scene, Bernie Sanders has more right to be called the founding father of America because he's closer to the event than Augustine is to the resurrection of Christ. And then if we look at uh, the first formal articulation of penal substitution with Charles Hodge in 1871, that's roughly 40 years after, after Mormonism comes on the scene. So we have some real chronological issues if we're trying to claim that, that penal substitutionary atonement is the belief that the early church held, because there is a clear progression in the way that this doctrine has been articulated and grown and developed, but it's three foundational tenets are, are found with Augustine. They don't predate Augustine. Yeah, and Warren, I remember when you gave that Mormon illustration when we were having a private conversation. I thought that was extremely provocative in a good sense, because as I said earlier, that's my hero, Walter Martin, Kingdom of the Cults. Look at the name of this tape series, How to Witness to Mormons. Walter Martin was most definitely a thinker in the atonement school. Yet Walter Martin referred to Mormonism as a polytheistic pagan cult. Now, even though I revere Walter Martin to this very day, who is he to say that Mormonism is pagan when he, Walter Martin, is promoting the oldest pagan concept in the book 
the idea that the angry volcano god has to be appeased. Toss your pure virgin into the volcano, otherwise the whole village will be toast. Yeah. I mean, you know, we 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 can look we can, we can look at uh some of the Old Testament instances where God is coming in and he is saying like I don't don't offer your children to to Molech. Like don't don't do to me what you're doing to Molech and I don't I don't require human sacrifice. That's not what I that's not what I'm about. That's not what I want. Don't you dare do that unto me. I, I will judge you for it. And yet, uh, arguably, one of the leading, if not the leading view of the work of God involves um, the, the, the incarnation, death and resurrection of Christ, but in a very, let's just say, um, non-Orthodox light, where, where you actually have a human sacrifice appeasing the wrath of God where he is incapable of forgiveness and relenting without some other condition being met apart from just confession and repentance. You're right. We're very much in danger of turning God into Molech. Mm. And it, it's sobering. It's, it's truly, it's truly sobering, but there are many, many well-intended Christians that don't realize, and they haven't followed this line of thought through when I was, when I was embracing it, um, seven years ago, uh, and I started to see the problems with it a little about seven and a half years ago. And I started to see the problems with it. The only resources I could find, right, from my limited uh, Google search and, and even knowing where to go to get the answers, um, I, I wasn't really convinced with a lot of the argumentation. I found it really weak, lacking. It didn't have any biblical grounding. It didn't have any historical grounding. It felt uh, a little too um, uh, new age and, and spiritual emotionalism, and there wasn't any substance. And if that's where I had stopped, I might have been inclined to continue embracing penal substitution. But fortunately, I was able to start stumbling onto some really solid uh, historical uh, uh, information. And, and all of a sudden, I was able to really latch on and start studying. And I go, ah, Okay, there are legitimate issues with this that I need to consider and I need to have an answer for. And it's not that I didn't love Jesus when I affirmed penal substitution, just like those watching right now that affirm penal substitution. They affirm it because they believe that that's what a Christian is supposed to believe. Um, and so, you know, you're you're going along because you say, well, this is part of the the package of being a Christian. And if you were like me, you thought that was the only option. And, uh, and so this episode and, and this ongoing series is really intended to show you here's some of the biblical, some of the historical, some of the, the reasoned uh, objections to this view, some alternatives, and then you weigh this information, you viewer who is watching, you, you weigh this, you do your own due diligence, your own research. And then you take it before the Lord and, and you're responsible for how you interact with what we're presenting. There's no judgment against the individual viewer. It's just we're considering ideas. And often when you do that and you're not careful uh, and you criticize a belief, sometimes people will say, well, you're criticizing me because I hold it. And that's really not, not what we're intending to do here. We're just criticizing a particular view and giving the information so that you can kind of weigh that and make up your own minds. Yeah, we want to show people that they can make different inferences from the data set. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think I think if you stick through, dear viewer, if you stick through these next seven, I believe it's seven uh, episodes in this series, uh, I, I think you're going to see some really compelling uh, information some compelling arguments and reasons for realizing that perhaps there's a better understanding given the data and that God is a little bit, actually a little bit, perhaps even a lot of bit better than we have been believing.